to, to account for um, confounding is starting to be used more often. Um, and so you said that you're not sure what the implications are, I think, when there are unmeasured confounders. Um, and so I was just wondering if you've done like, any work towards like, maybe doing simulations to assess the impact of unmeasured So no, I haven't. And, uh, and uh, we don't even have that. Uh, I would to start with what I would really like to see is more uh, of this type of exercise because as I try to explain that exercise is not perfect because of the fact that we have a first IV stage. I would really like to be able to see more experiments where it's pretty clear that the experiment is where if I could randomly assign education and not just the cost of education, if I could randomly assign D in our case compared to the machine learning estimate of D. And even that, there are not that many. And I think we need to see more to try to understand even what's the, the landscape of the bias that remains uh, in different settings, in different institutions. Otherwise, I think it's hard to, uh, it's hard to do the exercise you are thinking about with having, without having a sense of the, the bias that might remain. Okay, and then you, you had also mentioned um, that the two machine learning methods that you used were pretty biased. Um, could you just comment on which one you used? So it doesn't really, it really doesn't matter. So the, 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 really what we are trying to, to do in this exercise is to say, since the tools keep moving, so we typically in, in a lot of exercises we tried lasso, uh, um, random forest, and uh, boosting. And, but someone could like something else. It, at some level, it doesn't really matter. The point is that we, this, the, the tools are still in constant evolution, to my understanding, and that's really not my uh, line of trade so much, but to my understanding, our understanding of their properties itself is not great. So if we want to make it useful now uh, for causal parameter estimates, either in this, uh, in this uh, settings, for example, where you're interested in differential treatment effect, or in the case where you're using it to, to remove the, uh, some nuisance parameter, then uh, all we really have to do is to uh, do this double uh, machine learning approach where you sample split and you're doing something in one part and the actual low dimensional exercise in the other part. And then the method and how good it is at some level doesn't even really matter on the <laughs> level. Presumably, the better it is, the more precise it's going to be. But you can live with a ton of bias and overfitting on the one side as long as you're trying to fit a, a, a low dimensional parameter on the other side. So that's basically, if there's one thing kind of that animates <laughs> all these examples uh, from the beginning to the end, it's that one. And you can project it onto other things than the best linear thing. For example, in the, in the example I just quoted at the end, what we are trying to predict is the, your, your, the probability that you would be employed anyway, even in the absence of the program. And that's the one, that's that, that's, that is the, the, the low dimensional parameter that is, the low dimensional parameter that is then plugged into the other side. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this uh, amazing insight. Uh, I'm wondering when you're running these experiments, uh, with the uh, different uh, villages, do they know what's going on and could that have an impact? That they know I'm not getting this great program and somebody else is. Well, uh, in a lot of cases, these uh, this programs are happening in, uh, in a sort of a phase-in way. So for example, in the microcredit program, uh, that organization was already uh, existing in, in these regions and they were uh, progressively expanding uh, at the edges. So in a way, uh, the people who are treated and people who are controlled were already left out from the first, ex the first expansion. And uh, they probably had some confused sense that at some point it's going to come to them. And the, the, the order in which that happened uh, was uh, uh, maybe they didn't fully understand where it was coming from. Uh, Depending on experiments, people are more or less aware of being uh, part of an actual experiment. They, they are always aware that data is collected on them because we, we, we ask them if we can collect data on them. But when you work with partners like that, the, you're, you're sort of following their expansion. So uh, they, they might not be aware that, they, they've been, that, that it's coming and when exactly it's coming. They would know that it's coming at some point. 
so there might be some some anticipation of that one. Uh, there was one question. Yeah. That's the last question. Hi, Professor Dufault. Uh, I used to be uh, RA at BNBR. So I have more like a high-level question about machine learning and economics. So um, uh, I know economic researchers are looking for causal effect, which is not very easy to be found uh, um, from machine learning algorithms. So I wondered, um, like, except um, uh, RCT, uh, is there other uh, way to uh, use machine learning algorithms in economic research um, to find causal effect? Well, I tried to give you one, uh, which is that idea of like, let's zero in on the causal effect and then use the machine learning to, re to uh, um, remove the, the rest, <laughs> to, which is, in a sense, a very conventional way to think in economics, which is there is one thing we're interested in, and then there are the control variables. And apply uh, you, with those modern methods applied to that very classical way of thinking. So that's one way. Um, uh, there might be others, but that, that seems to be the, the very natural, uh, uh, at least a very natural way to think about how the two framework can uh, intersperse. And again, the other thing is where, okay, you, ad you admit that machine learning is for prediction, but that one thing that it can predict is differential causal effect across groups. Uh, and so that's the second way that I talked about. And do you think uh, economists are still conservative toward uh, using machine learning algorithms? Uh, I don't know if conservative is the world. Uh, uh, I think a lot of people are interested. First of all, <coughs> some people become interested in prediction as well. Even for uh, even for policy, sometimes sometimes what you need is a prediction. It's not the causal effect. So then you want to use tools that are good for prediction. Um, it, so I don't know that uh, I don't know that economists are particularly conservative vis-à-vis -vis these tools. Uh, it seems to me that it's more the opposite. Everybody and their sister are trying to use machine learning tools without having any understanding of uh, what they do and want to do. Uh, I, 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 I think it's more this way than that way. So eventually, it will all converge towards something sensible. You know, in the next few years. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is...